Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on building consumer trust with top animal wellness certification. I will be presenting the NSF Raise Without Antibiotics certification, and my colleague Elaine will be presenting the Global Animal Wellness Standard. A few points to mention before we get started. The webinar has been started in mute mode to minimize disruptions. If you have questions, please use the chat feature on the bottom left side of the screen. We will address the questions in the chat during the Q&A section at the end of the presentation and names will be kept anonymous. This webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive an email with a link to download the webinar video as a PDF as well as the PDF of the slides. Please feel free to call or email us following the webinar should you have any additional questions. And of course, we don't want to forget to mention our coloring contest. For any parent working from home and needs an activity for your kids, you can download our coloring contest page and enter to win an Amazon gift card. Please submit the drawings to us by April 23rd by emailing consumervalues at nsf.org. My name is Janelle Abro, and I am one of the Business Development Managers for Consumer Values Verified. CVV is focused on label claim certification services such as raised without antibiotics, gluten-free, non-GMO, certified plant-based, and true source honey and organic. I've been with NSF for the past five years with a previous role in beverage quality. So today, Elaine and I will be talking about how NSF raised without antibiotics Certification and the Global Animal Wellness Standard go hand in hand and the benefit to obtaining and bundling both certifications. Notice on this slide how animal safety and animal wellness falls under each category of the supply chain, from pre-farm to farm to transport to harvest and even in retail. You can differentiate your product from self claims with NSF's independent Raised Without Antibiotics mark and the Global Animal Wellness Standard. Certification helps consumers identify animal products that do not contribute to the growth of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So which industries are you in? Beef, chicken, eggs, pork, input supplier, or other? Please submit your answers in the chat box on the left side of the screen. We'd really love to hear from you. I'll give you guys a few moments to do that. It's great. I see some answers coming in, and it looks like we've got a pretty good mix here. So, yeah, that is great. Dairy, eggs, chicken, and eggs, chicken, pork. Awesome. That is great. Thank you all. So you can now combine NSF's Global Animal Wellness Standards and Raised Without Antibiotics certifications to have both audits completed at the same time. Some of the benefits of the Global Animal Wellness Standard is that it establishes management systems to ensure animal welfare, health, feed, housing, and husbandry. The Raised Without Antibiotics certification helps consumers identify animal products such as meat, poultry, dairy, eggs, all that are raised without exposure to antibiotics. One study shows that 59% of U.S. shoppers are looking for antibiotic-free labels. As they look to minimize negative health effects from the foods they eat, a growing number of consumers are demanding transparency in food production methods. Many consumers want more information about how their food is produced, including whether animals were raised in cages, what they were fed, and whether they were exposed to hormones, steroids, or antibiotics. The food industry is responding to the growing public health concern with several major, major restaurant chains making public commitments to remove antibiotics from their menus significantly impacting their dairy and protein supply chains. A new survey from Tectomic and the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals finds that most of our consumers, 77%, are concerned about animal welfare as it applies to their food. More than two-thirds of consumers pay some or a lot of attention to food labels regarding how the animal was raised. 
This trend is reflected in what retailers are seeing as over 70% of those stocking products with humane claims report sales increases. Helping to drive this growth are retailers requiring manufacturers to get third-party certification claims. As you can see here, 72% of consumers believe that a label claim is very important, and 37% are willing to pay more for a product that has a certified claim. We're increasingly aware of the public health risks posed by antimicrobial antibiotic resistance. The CDC estimates that at least 2 million illnesses and 23,000 deaths are caused by antibiotic resistance. Many consumer surveys rank antibiotic use as one of the top three concerns that consumers have. If you're wondering how it can spread, a complex chain of events can cause bacteria to develop resistance to antibiotics. The process starts in the gut, where antibiotics act to kill bacteria causing illnesses, as well as good bacteria protecting the body from infection. The remaining drug-resistant bacteria are now able to grow and take over. Some even pass drug resistance onto formerly harmless bacteria causing further problems. The bacteria can spread to humans through improperly handled or cooked meat products. Food crops may be exposed to fertilizer or water runoff containing drug-resistant bacteria from animal feces. Farmers and food processing workers can be exposed to antibiotic-resistant bacteria and subsequently pass them along to other humans. Studies suggest that world use of antibiotics is roughly equal between human medicine and animal food production. The WHO has identified this widespread use of antibiotics as the main factor in the rapid evolution of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, the so-called superbug. The WHO, UN, and the CDC have identified the emergence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria and strains as a high-priority public health concern. The NSF raised without antibiotics certification helps consumers and processors identify and choose animal products that were raised without antibiotics and do not contribute to the growth of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. The protocol provides for the independent review of farm practices and health management procedures, inspection and sampling on the farm to verify compliance and detect violations, and supply chain traceability to ensure accurate representation of packaged goods certified as raised without antibiotics. The primary aim of the program is to create clear criteria for the determination of foods or products to be considered raised without antibiotics. We strive to provide a solution for suppliers to demonstrate to the supply chain and consumers that they are mindful of antibiotic concerns and are taking active measures to provide trusted products to the marketplace. Consumers can be assured that products carrying the certification mark are not contributing to this global public health crisis. With NSF International, you have the benefit of more than 75 years of independent public health and safety inspection, verification, and certification expertise. This enables us to help you navigate current regulatory and certification requirements with confidence. The certification process includes four simple steps, application, audit, post-audit, and certification. NSF has trained auditors internationally to complete the on-site audit. The timeline and process follows a similar model to many other certification or audit programs you're familiar with. The company seeking certification applies, and this can be the brand, the processor, or even a farmer. The application and compliance documents are reviewed. The inspection takes place on-site. The NSF team in the office then reviews the inspection report and if there are any non-conformances, the applicant has a chance to resolve them. Then the certification decision can be made. The operation is subject to an additional unscheduled NSF audit. NSF will notify the operation no more than 48 hours in advance. Typically, this process takes about 14 to 24 weeks, depending on the readiness of the client, the farms, the facilities, and the time to respond to any corrective actions. The NSF protocol covers all antibiotics, including ionophores and coccidiostats, that are not used in, on humans. Coccidiostats are chemical agents added to animal feed, as for poultry, that serve to delay the process of the life cycle or reduce the population of pathogenic coccidian to the point that disease is minimized and the host develops immunity. Ionophores are any molecule as of a drug that increases the permeability of cell membranes to a specific ion. 
we allow for three categories, A, B, and C, where ionophores, chemical custody stats, may be permitted to prevent infection. As a requirement of the protocol, we request that a company identifies which category best describes your farm. This category must also be listed under your Raise Without Antibiotics logo that is on the packaging. And in later slides, I'll be able to show you an example of this. The protocol relies on these key definitions for antibiotics and raised without antibiotics. An antibiotic is defined as a medicine such as penicillin or its derivatives that inhibits the growth or, of or destroys microorganisms. Antibiotics are chemical substances produced by various microorganisms and fungi, having the capacity to inhibit the growth of or to destroy bacteria and other microorganisms. Raised without antibiotics defines animals and animal byproducts that have been from birth or hatching and during suckling period raised without the use of antibiotic treatment. When medically necessary, as determined by an authorized veterinary surgeon, any animals treated with antibiotics or exposed to antibiotics through maternal exposure via suckling at any time may no longer be represented as certified. The scope of the program covers livestock feed, livestock production for human pet or pet food products, as well as packaging and sale of those human and pet food products. The label claim on package covers all animal products such as meat, poultry, dairy, and eggs. A farm, feed mill, abattoir, and or food processing facility must prove it has the necessary practices in place to ensure antibiotics are not used. There is an independent process-based review of farm practices and health management procedures. The supply chain system review includes documents and record keeping, product integrity and traceability, storage, transport, and packaging, internal quality control and compliance, training, and supplier approval and monitoring. The certification program is based on some key general requirements. Animals shall not be administered antibiotics. Treated animals will be removed from the certified status. However, animal welfare cannot be compromised in order to maintain certified status. Antibiotics administered with vaccination is not permitted. Inspections are required and operations must allow unannounced audits. The facility must maintain living conditions which support capability of antibiotic reproduction, like sanitation and stocking density. Applicants must provide personnel training on requirements and compliance procedures and certified operations must have a control plan for non-compliant products. The certified operations must also maintain documentation to, related to their supply chain and processes. Farm sites that raise or handle livestock may choose to be certified if the farm site wants to own the certificate and promote their own operation or product as certified with a claim, or will be required to be compliant and involved in the certification process when a customer of theirs, like a food processing site or a brand, seeks certification for a product originating from the individual farm site. Processing sites that handle products of animal origin are required to be certified if the food processing site or brand wants to own the certificate and promote their own operation or product as, as certified. And they are required to involve individual farm site suppliers in becoming compliant for the food processor's own certification. Processing sites that manufacture livestock feed may choose to be certified if the feed processing site wants to promote their own product as certified with a claim. A feed processing site is required to be certified when a farm site seeks certification for their own operation or product, unless it is vertically integrated, which is in which case is only compliance not certification is required. There are additional certification path options for co-packers or entities that want to apply as a group under a group management plan. For more information about these options, please feel free to work with me after the webinar. As for the welfare of animals and livestock, is it cannot be compromised for the claim Raised Without Antibiotics protocol requires animal wellness policies and procedures to be in place. 
some policies and procedures that are subject to be reviewed at the desk audit and at the on-site audit to verify policies are being followed and practiced on-site. Some animal wellness policies include housing systems, space allowances, gestation stalls, farrowing systems, cleaning and sanitation, pest management, litter management. Evidence of an animal wellness audit and certification by a third party may be used to show compliance. Therefore, the NSF Global Animal Wellness Standard would be accepted as compliance for the animal wellness requirements of the Raise Without Antibiotics certification. The beauty of bundling these certifications provides the opportunity for both audits to be completed together by the same auditor. This helps with scheduling, time management, and efficiency of seeking and completing certification requirements. A farm, feed mill, abattoir, and or food processing facility will have an initial scheduled audit. The operations are subject to an additional unscheduled audit, and an announced audit are done at mid-year and, annu and at annual renewal cycle. They will be based on 25% of each facility type at mid-year, an additional 25% of each facility type at renewal. These are the logos that can appear on your client's packaging after certification. The NSF Raised Without Antibiotics logo can be used for products sold internationally in accordance with local regulations. The logos cannot be altered. Logo use on customer-facing materials, on marketing materials or packaging, must also list the category type below the logo, just as we have it pictured here. Each operation will also receive a formal certificate of compliance. How many of you already have some kind of animal welfare program or certification? Please submit the, your answers on the left side of the screen. Okay, so I see that many of you don't have an animal welfare program in place yet, and we're really glad that you're here. And I hope this presentation gives you more insight on what customers and consumers are really looking for. Thank you for listening in. This concludes my presentation. We will have time at the end of Elaine's presentation for questions. And I do see some questions for, coming in from the chat box, and we'll get to them at the very end. So, Elaine, please take it away. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Janelle, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time today and um, listening in on this uh, webinar. You know, given the, we'll just say it, weirdness of today's um, life and, and our new normal, um, this is much appreciated having you here on the call. So, I'm going to be moving forward on the presentation to kind of give you a little bit more of the background of the Global Animal Wellness Standard um, and kind of give you some insight as to why there is such a nice uh, close fit between um, the CB2's uh, Raised Without Antibiotics Protocol and the Global Animal Wellness Standards, and hopefully you'll, you'll understand the values there. So I'm the Technical Manager of the Animal Wellness Programs for NSF International, and uh, my role is really about looking at the programs that NSF delivers in terms of our um, animal wellness programs. And this is uh, both in North America, but also globally. So um, I help with the regional uh, development of some of the programs that we're delivering. Some of these programs are uh, uh, um, schemes that are owned by someone else, but a lot of them are schemes owned by NSF because NSF has a strong history of developing um, uh, our own protocols and standards. And so um, what I'm talking to right now is an NSF proprietary standard. We released the standards in uh, 2019 in February. And um, what we have developed in this um, set of standards is um, taking a look at animal wellness in a very different um, way than what we're typically used to. And we're taking a systematic approach. It's a very familiar approach if you're thinking from the food safety side of things. Um, but when it comes to animal welfare, it tends to have always been 
a very uh, field observation um, focused approach to auditing. And that has value, and there is there are components of that in the global animal wellness standards. But it really does go back to what the audit um, will show is not just on the day of the audit that a facility is doing well, but that they can demonstrate how they're doing the right thing um, year round, and that they can they can provide evidence to support that. But one of the other things that's important about the approach we took in the standards is that. You can see by this, the cyclical thing here on the corner, um, there's, a, there's a relationship between the health and, and uh, management of animals and livestock um, as we're raising them and the health of uh, human beings as well as the environment. And that connection is never going to change. So we always have to try to make sure that we're uh, keeping those things in mind when we develop the standards. This is a really good example of the connection between the health of animals and the health of people when we're talking about antibiotic resistance. So this is why it's a really nice natural fit. The scope of the global animal wellness standards includes the key poultry and livestock species, so beef and dairy cattle, pigs and small ruminants, both for meat and for um, um, milk. Um, as well as meat and egg-laying poultry. And the applicable operations and processes include all the way from birth or hatch to slaughter. So we're looking at all of the points in the supply chain, which is really supportive of what the Race Without Antibiotics program needs in terms of being able to provide assurances about um, the Race Without Antibiotics at production but also the traceability of the, pro the animals and the products from those animals from their point of, of um, production all the way to the end product. So some of the key drivers and the standards internationally that guided the development of the NSF Global Animal Wellness Standards include the ISO Technical Specification 34700 that's an animal welfare management system, and it was released in December 2016. So you can recognize how, uh, frequent, how recent this um, t change in perspective to, towards looking at animal welfare from a management perspective, a management system perspective is. And it's also guided by uh, the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, Principles and Guidelines for Animal uh, Welfare. They're included in both the terrestrial and the aquatic animal health codes. The NSF Global Animal Wellness Standards are directly aligned to the five freedoms. We also found um, uh, excellent um, resources from Batro et al. In, in a paper released in 2007 that included a breakdown of those five freedoms to some very clear-cut welfare principles and welfare criteria. And the, the breakdown in that manner actually makes it a little bit more uh, understandable to producers to understand how, how they are actually um, affecting or being able to uh, demonstrate that they're actually meeting a five freedom. So they would look at it from the perspective of the welfare criteria, and then that would, would uh, um, reach back and show the five freedom connection. So what we've done in the, in the standard is really help provide operations with a tool to be able to demonstrate an animal wellness management system. But when looking at how to create that, it really comes down to some very significant but very straightforward questions. Why do they do it? How are they doing it? Who's managing it and taking care of it? Where and with what? How are they doing and how can they do better? So I'm just going to go very quickly through all of these elements so that you'll understand it's a pretty straightforward approach to developing that management system. The so why they do it is all covered in the section on the management commitment, policy, procedures, and planning, which covers a policy statement, which is really the, the crux of the matter, and it is what management states is the reason why they're managing animal wellness and welfare. Then designation of a responsible management person, uh, conducting a hazard analysis, 
and then determining which hazards actually need to be uh, managed at their operation and a requirement to meet regulatory requirements. It also looks at and includes the plans, protocols, and procedures. That includes prerequisite programs, any control points in their procedures, and crisis management. Who does it includes a designated animal wellness lead or team, and the, uh, and the personnel that have acquired knowledge, skills, and competency. And so we're looking at employee training programs and training records to demonstrate that that's been achieved. We've also included health and safety requirements in the standard because of the complications um, that can occur between uh, humans and animals from a health perspective, um, bi-directional. So zoonotic diseases can go both ways from human to animals and animals to humans. But there's also an aspect of it, uh, particularly when you're looking at livestock, uh, cattle, and larger size uh, livestock. Um, uh, the health and safety when handling animals, so the risk of injury to the handlers. Um, but other aspects included uh, in just being able to manage that uh, health and safety of employees and animals is maintained. How are we doing is assessed in the sections on monitoring animal welfare plan implementation and outcomes. This includes monitoring activities verification that the monitoring activities are being done and corrective actions when there's deviations or thresholds have not been met. It also includes internal audits, ex external audits, and a management review, which is really a review of their entire system to ensure it's doing what they intended it to do. The where and with what is covered in the management section on facilities, equipment, and materials. And this is really about describing the site, location, land, and infrastructure, and then equipment and materials that are used at the operation. But it also focuses on inputs and contracted services and the reliance on a strong supplier approval or contracted service approval program. The other part of the animal wellness standards, the global animal wellness standards, includes the animal wellness programs, which is where we focus on the health of animals, the housing and environment, feed and water, and then good handling, husbandry, and management practices. I'm just going to go through that a little bit, section of slides. So in the animal source health and safety, animal source and traceability is covered, welfare of animals and transport, the Animal Health Management Plan, and Responsible Use of Antimicrobials. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of its direct rele relevance to when we're having um, a bundled race without antibiotics audit. Biosecurity, culling and euthanasia, and monitoring. So the race without antibiotics uh, protocol was directly um, compared to what we've covered in the NSF Global Animal Wellness Standards. And we found some direct equivalence where it's actually being assessed completely um, uh, for the purposes of the Race Without Antibiotics Protocol while the, an auditor would be doing an audit to the Global Animal Wellness Standards. And this is one of the key areas that the majority of information is being found um, so that when the auditor is assessing this section, of the Global Animal Wellness Standard, it's actually providing the required information for the race without antibiotics protocol. There are other elements of the, the race without antibiotics protocol that are covered and um, assessed in different parts of the Global Animal Wellness Standard, uh, including what I've already covered in the management system, but also in other aspects of the, the next few sections of the animal um, programs. But in the responsible use of veterinary medications, including antimicrobials, this is where the, the vast majority of information is required. But it is looking at the specific requirements for a prescription from a veterinarian or another suitably trained person um, for the use of antimicrobials. In the case of race without, without 
um, this does not mean that this section is not completed. It is completed because what's going to happen there is the auditor will be looking for normal, uh, regular use of antibiotics for uh, any purposes uh, versus the use of antibiotics as required to treat animals and then exclude them from the program in some manner. So we're also looking at things like appropriate storage use, inventory, and disposal of medications and uh, respecting withdrawal times for any administered veterinary medicines and medicated feeds. This is where we're focusing on treatment records and the purposes thereof when antibiotics are used on an operation that is also uh, co-applying for race without antibiotics certification. In the section on uh, providing good housing and environment, this is the section seven of the standard on design, maintenance, and protection in the animal environment, facilities, and equipment. And in this section, we cover the, the sanitation, maintenance, and pest control programs, predator control programs, stocking densities, thermal environment and lighting programs, ventilation and air quality, and water quality if we're talking about aquaculture and monitoring of all of these programs. Again, there are some aspects of this, of this section that are important. When we're looking at the requirements of the Razor Without Antibiotics Protocol, um, particularly, for example, the stocking density that has, there's a direct question um, of equivalence in, to the protocol. In the providing feed and water section, we're looking at the provision um, of water, feed and water to the animals. And so the focus there is on the actual feed and water equipment provided, the feed and water program, and then monitoring. And then the good handling, husbandry and management section, we're looking at the animal handling program, any wolf acts of abuse that are prohibited husbandry and management practices, and then monitoring again. So what we're looking for in, in general across the program is are the, the existence of programs, protocols that are supporting that, training the employees on those protocols, monitoring that the, the employees are doing according to the protocols, and that good records are kept of all of that. And that will generate the majority of evidence to support that they're um, animal wellness programs are being followed. So when we put it all together, we have the management's policy and responsibility in place. There's a hazard analysis that has focused on those hazards of relevance to the facility and how they've implemented control measures, the programs and procedures to allow them to, to implement those controls, the training provided to their personnel, measuring and recording that they are actually following their own protocols and achieving the, ob the objectives for animal wellness that they have put in place, and that they're then looking at their program, how they're delivering their, their compliance to meeting their own protocols and meeting their own objectives, and determining whether or not they need to revise any part of their program to achieve continual improvement. So that concludes the section that I wanted to go through um, in terms of the standard. And so what we can do now is take a look at some of the questions um, that have come in through the chat box, as well as if anybody has any other questions, um, this would be a good time to um, add those and we can follow up with you. Some of the questions, if you can't think of them right now, you can actually um, um, submit them at any point. Uh, you can, uh, there's an email address here that you can send them to, and we can follow up with those after the webinar. If you have any other questions about the certification, if you're interested, or how it relates to any other program that you may already be uh, being audited to, I'm um, more than happy to take a look at those questions and get back to you on it. So we're going to start taking a look at some of the questions, and let's just filter. So, um, there was one question that came in uh, during the segment on race without antibiotics. Um, and I don't know, uh, Janelle, do you want to tackle that first question there? Yeah. The Thank you. 
Thanks, Elaine. It seems that the first two questions were for race without antibiotics. So for the first question, in a multi-farm operation, does every farm need certification, or is this an audit of processes required by the farms and a sample of farms? So every farm needs an initial audit that is part of the supply for the Raise Without Antibiotics products. Um, after initial audit, that's when the 25% of each site type, whether it's a farm, feed mill, or abattoir, would be audited for renewal and mid-year cycles. Um, and then we have the second question is, antibiotics are necessary for the health and well-being of animals that are ill. How do you rectify the contradiction of promoting antibiotic-free alongside animal welfare when there are cases where in order to manage the welfare of animals, they need antibiotics? And that's an excellent question. Um, you know, we definitely stand behind and, you know, make the point that we, the welfare of the animals cannot be compromised by the certification. Um, to maintain the health and welfare of animals with, without antibiotics, um, our program encourages preventative measures such as vaccination and alternative treatments litter management techniques, and appropriate stocking density. And if a sick animal requires antibiotics for treatment, they can receive that veterinary care, but it must be removed from the actual program for certification so that animal would not be part of certification. As I mentioned, we definitely stand strongly behind the fact that the welfare of these animals cannot be compromised for certification. Um, Elaine, I think the next two questions were for you. Thanks, Janelle. So next question is, which retailers and supply chain operators have committed to the NSF's Global Animal Wellness Standards? Uh, right now, we're working with a couple of, of, of key retailers and, and um, um, restaurant chains. We haven't got the, the program fully implemented yet, so I can't really speak to a, a, a clear-cut commitment, but that is a progress um, because that's where the, the direction really becomes important for um, operations. We've completed several pilot audits to the standards, and mostly we're focusing on uh, using vertical, op vertical um, operating facilities, and that gives us an opportunity to really uh, test drive the standards. So as I said, they were released in February of 2019, so we're still trying to give it a good test run. Um, and what we're finding is, Facilities that are in vertically integrated um, uh, operations find that it gives them a better insight into the, the um, specific hazards that they are looking at and addressing at each of the points in their, in their supply chain. So what we're saying then is the ability then to demonstrate to your customer becomes clear and, it is a, and it's, you're able to do it throughout your entire supply chain. We're also finding that the, um, the processors that we're dealing with now are looking at this as an opportunity for um, really establishing uh, at, on a parallel level to the, the, um, the management system approach they have with food safety at their operations. Um, so they're, they're having a look at this. What we're finding also is that in some of the developed markets like North America, where there are strong industry standards already in place, that there is less of a requirement for, um, for op options uh, such as the Global Animal Wellness Standards, but we do hope to see uh, some, some growth in that area. What we're finding the largest area of growth here is in developing markets because a lot of times there is nothing there. And um, while I didn't clearly describe that in this particular um, webinar, we have uh, released other webinars where we really take a deep dive into the Global Animal Wellness Standards and explain how it's got a tiered structure, which means there's an opportunity for very basic operations that really haven't got anything in place to be able to be assessed to the standards and um, achieve a, 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 a good insight into what it is they need to focus on for priorities for animal welfare and wellness. And that means we have an ability to provide a tool that can allow for continual improvement um, across the chain for, um, for, for animal wellness. And at the end of the day, what that's going to do is it's actually going to strengthen the ability for all kinds of retailers and um, brands to be able to look at their supply chains and recognize that there is awareness and insight into uh, their animal wellness programs. 
So, again, I'd like to be able to say I can tell you definitively that there are a number of retailers and supply chain operators that are committed, but it's all in development at this point. And the next question, uh, what needs to be done to accept live animals into an operation? And does the third party hatchery need a certification? Okay, so I'm going to assume the question is related to the global animal wellness standards. If that's not the case, then um, I'll have the, the ask the submitter to kind of clarify the question. Um, so in the case of a poultry supply chain, um, we've, we've done um, audits of facilities where we've gone out with the global animal wellness uh, standard to the farm. And they are not um, vertically integrated with their hatchery. So that means they purchase their hatched birds, um, um, day old birds, from a hatchery. So what, the, what we would focus on at that point is at the farm, we would be focusing on their supplier approval. So this means that the, the hatchery is viewed as a supplier to that farm and the farm would have to have a process in place for reviewing and approving that hatchery. Um, a lot of times we're dealing with farms that are also part of a larger um, uh, vertically integrated company, and so often it's that company, the parent company, that would be the one that has the supplier approval program and would determine which hatcheries are providing the birds to the farms. So anyhow, that is the part of the, the program we would focus on if the hatchery was not included or directly owned in that vertically integrated operation. Um, what we, whether or not that company, the vertically integrated company that owns the farms, determines that the hatchery requires certification is really up to them. And that becomes part of the, the supplier approval program. But that does not stop the farm from becoming a certified facility to the Global Animal Wellness Standard. And I hope that answers that question. Um, next question um, is actually a pretty straightforward one about the webinar. Can the presentation be emailed out? And um, Janelle mentioned earlier, but if you, uh, as a registered uh, participant of this webinar, um, because it's recorded, the recording will be directly sent to you by email, and that way you'll be able to access this again and be able to view the presentation. Uh, next question, what are the qualification requirements for the auditors that perform external audits on animal wellness? Um, I'm going to answer that from the perspective of the qualifications that NSF uh, requires of the auditors that are performing the audits to the Global Animal Wellness Standards. So we have um, prepared and put into place an NSF Animal Wellness um, Auditor Competence Program, and it includes the requirements, prerequisite requirements um, for any auditors that we are considering for um, to be able to get qualified to do animal wellness audits. That that it also includes these NSF Global Animal Wellness Standards. What we're looking for basic requirements in terms of education, experience, um, uh, um, training that they have taken specifically on animal welfare and wellness um, or uh, auditing any of those uh, animal wellness programs. So if any of you have heard of uh, um, you know, training that's uh, relevant to that, that would be an example of, um, of uh, something we would look for in the background and experience of the auditor. We also then have um, requirements for specific training that we deliver or require of the standards. So NSF has recently released our NSF Global Animal Wellness um, Auditor Program Training. It's an online program, it's about three and a half hours, and it is focused on um, because the NSF Global Animal Wellness Standards is a new approach to, uh, to animal wellness and the way it's audited, we also decided we needed to have an appropriate development program for our auditors looking at animal wellness from the perspective of a management system. 
So we've created, and it is available online now so through NSF's training and education um, platform, um, training for auditors on auditing an animal wellness management system. Um, it was intentionally de designed for NSF auditors when they're going out to deliver audit to the global animal wellness standards. But I also found when I went through it, it would be it is a very useful tool for companies that are considering implementing a an animal wellness management system, or even to assess what they've got in place right now from a management perspective. So for internal audit auditors uh, for facilities and companies, um, this is a, a really good tool. If you want some more information on that, just send a quick email to animalwellness at nsf.org. Um, or you can check out on NSF's um, um, website in the training and education program for that training. But we can definitely provide that to information to you. Um, so that is a requirement that we have of our auditors. Then what we do is also provide um, direct um, uh, standard-related uh, training to the auditors to prepare them and qualify them. We also have calibration activities that are required. This includes shadow and witness audits, review of their submitted audit report, and customer uh, feedback after they've completed audits and so forth. So there's an ongoing calibration process for our auditors once they've been qualified to do the audits. I hope that answers that question. Okay. Um, Next question, how does the program integrate with or recognize commodity welfare programs such as those developed by trade organizations? Um, that's a really good question because um, the intention of the Global Animal Wellness Standards is that it really does reflect if a facility or a producer is already uh, being um, uh, meeting the requirements under com some of these um, commodity welfare programs, uh, there's industry associations, uh, standards, and, th and so forth. And quite often, a lot of what they've got in place actually provides the evidence to be able to provide a compliance to the requirements under the Global Animal Wellness Standards. So the standards are not looking for the, uh, the facilities to be able to, to put anything new into place if they've already met it under most of those trade organization standards. Uh, the, a lot of the work that we've been doing in 2020 um, has been about benchmarking the global animal wellness to existing standards and to existing industry and trade organization um, guidelines. That includes things such as the, um, the National Farm Animal Care Council uh, Code of Conduct up in Canada, the um, North American Meat Institute, National Chicken Council, uh, industry guidelines for animal welfare, and so forth, uh, as well as other certifications. So there is a lot of parallels across these programs. And when uh, an, a facility is being audited to the global animal wellness standards, that standard is going to look at some of the implemented things that are already in place because of those. And I hope that answers that question. OK. And I think the last one is um, yeah. for me. Or, yes, we've got the third party question that's pertaining to also the raise without antibiotic. So, does the third party hatchery need the certification? Um, and the answer to that is no, the hatchery does not. We just need a certificate or document confirming that the antibiotics were not given or used from the hens that laid the eggs. Um, I hope that was a simple and easy answer to that question. Um, so I'm just confirming we do not have any other questions at this point. Um, we definitely want to thank you all for joining this presentation. Um, and yes, you will receive an email with a link to download the webinar, the video portion, as well as a PDF of the slides. Um, please don't forget to submit your kids coloring contest to us by April 23rd um, to win an Amazon gift card. Just email us at consumervalues at nsf.org. Um, Again, it's consumer values at nsf.org. Uh, thank you again, everyone, and we hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you, thank you, everybody.